Hey everyone, Joe here, and today I'm going to be doing a teardown of this auto page remote starter. Honestly, I was going to scrap this thing anyway. If it's, I've installed it in about three cars in the past 10 or 12 years. It's, it's pretty beat up, it's aged, and the auto page company doesn't even make these anymore because they're out of business, which means this is no longer a supported unit. So I guess before throwing it out, I figured to make a pretty cool teardown video. So I'm pretty curious. Let's get started. Now before we open this up, it's worth mentioning what each of these connection ports are responsible for. That way when we do look inside, we have a better idea of why it was designed the way it was. So starting on this corner, this two pin connector over here attaches to an LED and that's for indicating what kind of features you have enabled. This harness over here with these thick wires go to your key cylinder. This actually switches to your starter circuit and your accessory to turn the car on. This spot here is for the switch that would program the remote start on certain features. Here would be the antenna, so that's over here, unplugged over here. And the antenna is right over here, it usually goes in your windshield. And the other side, we have unlock and lock wires. Here we have a bunch of wires. Uh, some things that are pretty common on these kind of harnesses would be like things like trunk release or ground wall running. That way you can have different accessories depending on your installation. And the last harness here are connections to your parking lights. So when you do turn on the remote start, you have an idea where it is outside. Okay, let's start unplugging these harnesses. That one's tight. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, all the harnesses are gone, and if we turn this around, you can see there's four Phillips head screws. And I'm pretty sure that's all we need to take this apart. All right, so let's just lift this guy up. Whoa, a lot more than I thought would be inside here. So the first thing that I'm gonna note in here are, look how big those traces are. Which makes sense because this is the main spot where you're gonna be switching all those high currents for your starter and accessories and ignition wires. And I wonder if they're even the same on the back. Oh yeah, look at these things. I mean, they're huge. And if you notice, they kept the solder mask off the board so they can actually put more solder on here, giving it a better uh, current rating capability because those traces are pretty thick, but they made them even thicker by putting more soldering on there. And right to those traces are these, I guess they're relays, and they're, they're pretty tiny. The ones you see in cars, in your fuse box, or even the ones that you can buy at an advanced auto parts or, or similar stores, they're much bigger than this. And if you look here, I guess they use some hot glue. I guess this connector isn't strong enough and someone's putting things back in and out of there. That's kind of chintzy. I don't like that at all. And look, there's some over here too. That's uh, that's weird. But if you look here, there's that little uh, resistor meant to protect that LED. And working my way down straight through the middle, I guess this is the microcontroller that controls all of this stuff around here. It's the main brains in the unit. And I'm trying to make out what kind it is. Okay, so it's pretty persistent and I went ahead and took an alcohol wipe and, and I wiped off that yellow, uh, I guess, lot number or I don't know what that was on the chip. It's pretty easy to read now. It's an HT46R23, and it was a microcontroller. If you look over here on Google, it pulls up a company called Holtec, and it's an 8-bit microcontroller unit. And that's pretty much what I expect from a small controller like this, 8 bits. We don't need like a i7 or anything crazy like that. It's just switching some relays on and off. And if I go through the next chip here, it says here it's a ULN2003APG. This is a Darlington transistor array, and if you look at the traces, they go straight into that connector right here. And if we turn them over here, these are the ones that go over there, and it also goes through here. See how the uh, controller goes right into here, and then it gets outputted through there, and right into there. And that's that harness I was talking about that has programmable outputs. Uh, if you look at the data sheet on the controller, the remote start controller I mean, it shows that most of these outputs for like uh, 
different kind of outputs or a trunk release, it's a 200 milliamp. So I'm gonna guess that this guy has 200 milliamps for each pin. So I'm gonna actually show you the dash to this guy. That's right here. This is how it looks inside. Your typical Darlington transistor layout. And looking right here, it says your output current single output is 500 milliamps max. So if you really want to, you could overdrive your output, say beyond 200 milliamps to 500 milliamps, but you're kind of risking the absolute max ratings for this chip. When I zoomed in a bit, I actually noticed that they actually labeled the pins just like they have in the, in the data sheet. So if you look here, here it's channel three. Here it's uh, ignition number three for another ignition if you had a third ignition in your car or you wanted to use that wire for something else. And even if you look down to here, for the lock and unlock wires, they label it, see? D and slash UL, D slash L. And I always thought the lock and unlock wires had relays that clicked them on and off, but it looks like they just use a bunch of transistors and, and diodes to get that negative or positive polarity going. Now, I tried looking up this chip here it's a ST microelectronics part, EZ66724, and it's a 324 on top. I have no idea what this is. I tried Googling the crap out of this thing, and all I got was this ST microcontrollers, or ST microelectronics website, and I, I couldn't get anything else on it. It is by the antenna, so it might be something for the antenna to decode it, but I, I just don't know for sure. I also Googled the crap out of this chip too, and I I can't find it on Google. But if you look at the traces here, you see these two pins over here, they go up, I guess underneath this relay, and I'm gonna guess to this connector here. This is the button for programming, so I'm gonna guess that this chip is used for debouncing, so when you push the button, it doesn't give electrical noise, and, and it kinda gives multiple hits to the microcontroller when it's trying to sense what's going on. That's gonna be my best guess. And if you look, it goes right here, to do this resistor right into this pin. So I think it's a debound circuit. And if someone happens to be a better Google Ninja than I am, and you do happen to find this, just put one of those let me Google that for you links in the comments below, and um, that'd be much appreciated. It'd be embarrassing, but it's, it's better just to know. And the last chip is actually the same as that one, that Darlington transistor array. And I actually traced these out. And if you look on this side, these are not used, so I guess these are for future use. Um, the only ones that are used are these two, but the other ones are mapped to the controller. And if you follow this one right around here, that's that parking uh, light connector. It also has a horn output. And I think that's that programmable horn output. It's a brown wire. Makes sense why it's there. And this guy right here, I guess it's going to this relay, which switches on and off the parking lights. So that, that's about it for, for ICs. And if we look at the PCB, I already noted about these traces here having solder on them to, to have a better uh, current capacity. They also did the same thing for the parking lights. I guess they're really worried about heat. Uh, some things about PCBs, in case you didn't know, these little hash marks here, you see how it doesn't really do anything? It's just there. Uh, sometimes they're used for kind of like a grid for RF. I think for this PCB, it's used for something called thieving. Basically what thieving is, yeah, you can see a whole bunch of it over here. What thieving is, when they put this into, um, I guess, ferric chloride or any kind of etchant, they don't want to waste how much uh, the etchant gets saturated. So they actually put a bunch of dummy copper here, just so it only needs to take away this copper area here, and this area here, and this area here, just enough to get the pattern going. It's, a, it's kind of like an economic solution to, to save money for the PCB fabrication house. And if you're ever curious about the date of a PCB, uh, you could find a four digit code somewhere on the PCB. So I mean, I didn't find anything on this side. I only found it on this side here. And it usually has these kind of like seven segment display looking numbers. And you'll read here 0739. That means that in the year 2007, this PCB was produced on the 39th week of that year. So we can confirm that to see how it was made. Here we have 424 2007. I guess the design was made at that point and the PC was, was manufactured a little bit thereafter. So it, it, it does coincide pretty well. This one here looks like it's just the model number or the file name they had it for whatever naming convention they had for their products. 
This I'm not quite too sure. One thing I got to comment on this PCB is that they have a, a pretty big mix of surface mount components and, and through hole. And I understand some of the through hole this year is actually the, the resonator to make this thing um, to actually count its clock cycles. But they have things like a, like a transistor here, a few transistors here. I mean, they could have gotten surface mount ones just like and the other one, same with these diodes, they could have gotten service map, but they went bigger. And I don't think the door locks have a lot of current, so I don't know if they're sure why they even have a through hole package. Through hole package is used for more current. Like I can understand this resistor here, um, but some other things are, it's kind of strange. Like if you look here, they got a service mount diode, but then if you look here, that same exact diode right here is through hole. So I don't know what they were trying to achieve. I guess the designer was kind of lazy. I'm really not too sure what they were thinking. Another thing I don't see in this PCB are these, um, they're like small circular copper dots. They're called fiducials. And they're usually on the corners of PCB. And what they do is they'll actually, um, if, the, if this board was blank, it had no components on it, it would be fed into a conveyor and brought up. And this little machine would come down and just start placing the surface mount parts together and it needs a reference. So it actually would camera in on one spot and call that zero, like or the origin, and then it would camera in another spot. And then based on those coordinates, it would know exactly where to place the components. And I don't really see that here. The only other way they can do it is to manually pick a spot or a pad, I guess one of these little pads here and call that the origin. That's not really good manufacturing process. Um, a good rule of thumb is to have fiducials on where the components are going to be. It wouldn't be on this side because there's no components. But I'm surprised they don't have that here at all either. I mean, I guess, what else can I really expect? The board does have hot glue to secure the connector in, so I guess they weren't really too concerned with some quality issues. Okay, so maybe people do glue things, but they don't really use hot glue. They use things called RTV. And, and now that I think about it, this might be RTV, but really what you want to do is find a connector that kind of has pegs in the bottom so that when someone does plug things in and out, it doesn't move around. Glue is kind of like your last option. You'd want to fix this, but you never know. Maybe they had a, an engineering change order to get this done. But overall, I mean, it's a nice little city. It kind of looks like a city, right? It's, it's nice, it's small. It, it looks well laid out enough. And, and honestly, AutoPage had a pretty good reputation for their remote starts. I'm not too sure why they went out of business. I guess you can just Google that, you know, another test for that Google Ninja out there to tell me what happened to AutoPage and, and why they went out of business in 2017. But it's not a bad board. It's a standard thickness. It's it's green like every other board I see on the internet um, or in a product. But uh, no, I like it. It's it's not bad at all. I can't use it anymore, but that's, that's all right. Got a good teardown out of this. And honestly, it doesn't even look that hard to build. Maybe I'll just build my own. All right, I guess this guy's done. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you learned anything at all about electronics, PCBs, or even how a remote starter works inside, please consider giving the video a like. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, consider subscribing to my channel. I do videos about every week, maybe a little bit over a week. And if you have any questions at all about the video, please leave them in the comments below.